Hey guys, welcome back. It is your favorite Gimp of Limp, and I'm here with the review for Death Ride. And I'm doing Death Ride kind of as a whole. Uh, the the system itself is what I'm I'm talking about now. I've specifically played Death Ride Ross. There might be other aspects to Death Ride that I'm unaware of. I know it does get a lot lot bigger with some of the game systems. I mean, the, the whole Normandy beach landings down to the platoon level. I mean, that's, that's, that's massive or it can get massive. And then what they've got going on, obviously with Kursk and uh, the Eastern front, there's just so much of this game, but I wanted to talk specifically about the, the death ride system itself and uh, my thoughts on it after I've experienced some time with the game. Now, I'm not going to touch on the components too much. I talked about that during the video series I did on Ross. Uh, there's some pluses, there's some minuses, but it's, it's really the system itself that you need to kind of concern yourself with. And what I've kind of come to understand with it is, is Death Ride is almost unique when it comes to war games in that it's this personal passion project uh, by the guy who's who's made the game and done all the, the points of it. And it really does have this like crafted feel to it. This I've used this word before, but artisanal feel to it. It's, it's not a, a Walmart war game, right? It's not the one where you go to the big box retailer and pick up your copy because they're mass producing it. This feels like someone hand put it all together and, and shipped it to you, which I, I think he actually does. So it has this it's completely different feel to it than uh, some run of the mill uh, type war games. Like, all right, so you open up a, a GMT game, right? Or a compass game or a lock and load game. And it it's all perfectly packaged. Everything is as supposed to be with shrink wrapped and little uh, punch out counters, everything glossy and beautiful and great and all that stuff. You know, that's the, the mass produced ones. And this doesn't fit that category. And that has its its bonuses, but it has some drawbacks to it as well. I will go ahead and tell you right up front that Death Ride is not for the, the average war gamer. I think it's designed for a very specific type of war gamer. And it needs someone who does not mind having to put the work into it if you want everything to run perfectly smoothly right so you take it out of the box put it on the table you start unpacking all the pieces put it all out and everything is is crisp and there's no errors there's no problems everything is just perfect right there death ride's not for you you you've got to put a little work into this one you it took me a little while uh, to actually get it to the table. I had to spend some time figuring out exactly what was going on with, ju with just the setup, right? So that's not even getting into the, the game system itself. It, it just takes effort. At, at times, you almost feel like you're fighting the game to be able to play the game. And I'll admit, that's, that's probably my biggest drawback to the game is the, the amount of just headaches that come with it. But... But, but it does offer a very unique experience. And I think it is a game that plenty of people would like if they're able to get past that initial entry, right? It's not easy to purchase. You have to, there's not even an option just to click to buy, right? You have to email the guy, he creates an invoice, he sends it to you, then you go and pay for it and all that other good stuff. So it's not just a, order online, it'll show up at your door. You, there, there's effort just to get it to your door, okay? But once you get it actually on the table, once you actually start moving the pieces and start grasping the system, uh, there is something special here. You can tell that he has put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into uh, designing this system. And I really like the overall theme and it, thematics, just what he's trying to accomplish with this game. He really is trying to give you a, a war gamer's war game. For example, one of the things that I really like about this game is that it has this suppression system, right? And in so many other games, we're used to dealing with steps. Almost, uh, God, most war games have steps, right? You know, 
full strength counter on one side, flip it over, it's half strength, hit it again, it's gone, right? Maybe you might have one that's got three or four steps if it's a little bit deeper game, but that comes with having extra counters and all this other crap. So generally that's what you're used to dealing with. Well, this has this whole suppression system to it. And when your units take hits here, they start becoming suppressed and that actually reduces their combat capabilities. However, it increases their defensive capabilities. So depending on the unit, you'll lose 10 or 20% for every st uh, step, every level of suppression. But you get to add those points of suppression to your defensive factor. It, it kind of simulates the fact that your units, as they're being hit, being worn down, they're going to hunker down. They're going to take more cover. If guys are dying off, they're going to have less targets to be shot at, period, anyway, right? So it's making it harder to hit, but their ability to fight back is dramatically reduced. A unit with uh, three levels of suppression is going to be 60% less combat effective than it was previously. That is horrible, right? They're no good in combat at that point, really but they're extremely hard to hit now. However, that system flips it around because there are two colors of suppression. You have the immediate color suppression, which is red, which is the turn where they get hit, but green comes into play uh, at the end. The counter gets flipped over, goes to green. They do add up if they get hit from multiple sources. Uh, five levels kills the unit, but if they get out of combat a little bit, they, they pull back, those suppression levels start to go down, right? they start to reduce and it's one or two levels of suppression are going down just depending if you're still adjacent to enemy forces. Uh, but it's signifying or symbolizing the fact that the, the units kind of regrouping a little bit, the NCOs, the officers, they're taking command, they're bringing guys back together, you know, getting their head back in the game. So they start to come back around. And I like that because that forces you to, to stay, right? To, to keep that aggression up, right? You don't want to have attacked this line of forces and put many of them at multiple levels of suppression only to back off. And then they're going to slowly build back up over a couple of turns. And now all of a sudden, all that work that you did is just moot. It's gone, right? Now they're combat capable again, and they're, they're coming back at you. So it kind of requires you to maintain your tempo of aggression. You can't just do a hit and run like in some other games. You might be able to push forward and do a, a big alpha strike and take out one or two units if you focus fire your stuff. And then you can back off, go to cover or something like that. Here, you can't really do that unless you actually get an eliminated result. Those units that you've hit with multiple levels of suppression will start to, to bounce back over a few turns. So you have to maintain this, this level of, of aggression and combat tempo in the game that you can keep up over the long term right? That you can keep the pressure up so they don't get a chance to regroup, refit, and then bring the fight back to you. I really like that. I think that is a very neat and deep system uh, that gives you the ability to see this combat going back and forth uh, as the units start taking hits. And with that, and I mentioned this so many times in the game, the, the operations phase, the the part where you're issuing your units orders, right? Where you're you're moving the counters, you're shooting the counters, all that stuff. All of that happens together, right? Now I didn't play it that way, and I think that's because I'm I'm so ingrained into we move, then we shoot, then we assault, then we end turn, and we do admin phase, right? You, you've got that so ingrained into your head. Well, you don't do that here, right? And this, you do all the, the stuff that your units are going to do. You do that all in the same phase. You can move this unit and then shoot with this unit and then go move another unit and then shoot with this. Unit. It gives you the ability to, to kind of uh, bounce back and, and uh, flow with the combat as you see fit. You aren't locked in 
Like I have to move this unit now because I need them to be in a shooting position then, you know, stuff like that. You know, other games where you have, you feel like you're kind of forced to because you have to prepare for the next phase. Well, here there is no next phase. You can move one unit into a position so they can be in a, a, a position to uh, return fire, right? They can do what's called overwatch in this game so they can protect other units that move up from the opportunity fire of the enemy. And I tried to show that in some combat that was going on, but due to the modifiers in my game, uh, the British were overwhelmingly <laughs> wiping out the Germans. Uh, but, but there's this really intricate system of the overwatch, the reserve movement, the opportunity fire. There's no real ch uh, chance where the opponent can just kind of sit back and let you do your turn because you still have lots of options. If you've planned out your stuff correctly, lots of options of what you're going to be doing on the opponent turn, but you have, this is the first game I've ever played. I can't think of another one off the top of my head where you can actually position units to fire at the enemy when they try to opportunity fire onto your own troops, right? And I'm not talking about just shooting. This is the opportunity fire against opportunity fire, right? You think about it uh, that way. It's not you just taking a shot. It's you saying this unit is in a position that if opportunity fire occurs in their line of sight, they get to shoot, right? That's what you're doing with these guys. Or you do reserve movement. Reserve movement means, all right, it's going to be the opponent's turn because you do assaults on, you know, your turn. But you put reserve move, uh, movement on a guy. That means that if they try to assault, right, get in hand to hand, get in close onto your units, you get to move these units up if you so desire, if you have the, the movement points and everything to get there. I love that. I think that is excellent. It uh, it changes that ingrained system that we're so used to in all these other war games, where it's this is done here, this is done here, this is done here, and then we do admin, right? It gives it to where there's just always a flow back and forth, and you can't ever sit back. Your opponent's always going to have units that can do something if he's doing it right. They can do something to you while you're doing your stuff on your turn. Not to mention the fact that it's just great that the operations phase is just all encompassing. Movement, shooting, all the good stuff, artillery, uh, close air support, all that's handled in the same phase. They're not broken up into these separate areas because maybe you want to move these guys up and then bring in some uh, close air support or artillery, right? You don't want to have that at the beginning of the turn because you're not ready for it, right? It makes it to where you can do your battle plan as it lays out, as it unfolds in front of you, instead of having to go, well, I didn't move him this turn, so I'm going to have to move him the next turn. And honestly, that is, that is the best part of the game, in my opinion. That is really what is setting this game uh, above and beyond some others. It's just getting to it and not to mention the fact that the modifiers oh my god you get buried in modifiers here uh there's what was killing me and i know i know i had to have missed it uh missed at least a few were just the sheer volume of modifiers and they all weren't located on one player aid some were for the most part, most modifiers were located on one player aid, but you still had to worry about this one that dealt with weapon systems because they may or may not get doubled. And then on top of that, you've got this little bonus table that applies for just the first part of the game. But these modifiers change every turn, so you can't even get used to them, right? If, uh, if this is going on at 1400, well, these modifiers change at 1500 and then they're going to change again at 1600. So you've got multiple sheets with different modifiers and not to mention you can't even kind of learn them and get ingrained to them because some of the modifiers are changing depending on the time of the day and it gets very unwieldy, right? You, you start to just, and there were a couple times where I just, flat goof the math in my mind. I'm like, what? It, 
is this double is this not double wait no i do double that so that means i can do this and and then is this applying here it it gets really bad if i had to do it over again i would have done something that i've done previously with some other games and have a couple of d20s or something sitting by uh that way i could kind of lay out the modifiers to where i could see it like okay this one's for the offensive modifiers this is for defensive modifiers that way i can uh, keep track of it right what's going on with it. it it can become cumbersome you're 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 juggling so much at once that you're going to lose track of what's going on and especially someone like me who's brain damaged as it is anyway and has short-term memory of a goldfish uh I figure out what's going on with this unit and then i'm trying to calculate for this other supporting unit and by then i've already forgot what was going on with the first unit and to finish talking about that there are some aspects of it that i think just need to be further fleshed out because they really just weren't very clearly explained and uh, things like moving and shooting in that i ended up just going with the the generalized if you used half your movement points or less you can shoot Right. And just be done with it because it was easier for me than trying to figure out what was going on with it, because the the rules in the, the rule book were just not clear on how that played out. And I found I was coming across a lot of situations like that. That was another drawback on that one is this one could just use just a little more time in the oven. Right. Have a fresh set of eyes who's a, a skilled developer come behind and, and tweak everything out so it's laid out succinctly and easier for people to grasp, just to catch some of the errors that are in there, uh, some of the confusing bits laid out all fresh because there is a, a really great game system here. It is one of the most unique ones that I've ever played, but it's just got so many little barriers that make it hard to get into that not many people get to enjoy it. When it comes to Death Ride, like I said at the beginning, Death Ride's only going to now, as it stands now, appeal to a very select group of gamers. Those who don't mind having to work for their reward, who don't mind having to thumb through the rule book to find that one line that references something. Uh, for example, there's one line that has to do with movement on the road, and it's in the stacking section of the rule book and that had to do with the fact that if your units are moving along the roads they can't stack more than platoon size and i'd actually made that mistake i had stacked them up to company size because that's what i knew they could stack that's the stacking limit right and that part that little rule wasn't in the movement section of the rules or at least i didn't see it in the movement section of the rules so because of missing that one little line, that changed the entire scope of the game. The, the Germans in the game that I was playing would have been severely delayed because they couldn't bunch their units up uh, to rush in. Although the British were kind of in the same boat, but the British were a little more stretched out anyway. It's a whole mess, right? And honestly, looking back at it, I probably just ignore that rule anyway, because I don't think it really fits very well. But that's just my personal opinion. But to get back to it, if you want to get into Death Ride, there is multiple Death Rides, like I said, that uh, cover different theaters. If you're into Normandy, if you're into Eastern Front, if they do have some smaller battles like the Ross, and I think they've got Salerno, uh, I think, yeah, Tarawa uh, as well. So if you want something Pacific. I think Death Ride is worth it for that specific type of gamer in a field that you're going to be happy putting that time into, right? So I like Pacific Theater. So if I had it to do over again, I probably would have picked Taro instead because that's going to appeal to me more personally. And that's one that I'm going to be fine with leaving out on the table and having to scratch my head and figure it all out to to game with it, but it is worth it to pick that one field that you like to get the, the game system, as long as you don't mind having to put in that fairly significant amount of effort to, to get it right. It's like the quote that I put in the, uh, one of the videos is like, is the juice worth the squeeze? It's 
mostly worth the squeeze, right? It's, there's just a very big squeeze with this game. There's really cool rule system that I haven't seen many others ever try. A lot of cool stuff going on with it. But you're going to have to kind of finagle it. Some of the rules aren't that clear. You're going to have to spend some time on some forums, asking some questions. Like, eh, is this right? Is this right? You might have to be okay with just going, eh, to hell with it. I'm just going to do this and we'll call it a day because it's easier. All right. And then that's not even touching on all the option rules of crap that comes into to play because I even use the option rules with this game. However, if you're one of those that wants everything perfect, a rata pisses you off, things not being perfectly clear piss you off, steer away from Death Ride, right? System's great, but there's just too many little barriers to entry. You'll end up regretting your purchase. If you're like me, you don't mind putting in a little effort to get your juice. Yeah, it's worth a squeeze. But all right, that's going to be it for me. I hope you guys did enjoy this coverage of Death Ride. Y'all take care. I will catch you in the next